ShotGlassDigital.com. Rebel Force Radio's Fangirls Going Rogue is brought to you by Little Debbie Snacks and their new Cosmic Cupcakes. Rebel Force Radio presents... Hello, what have we here? Fangirls Going Rogue. I met her in a Jedi chat room. Star Wars news, topics, and conversation. From the female point of view. I like the sound of that. With Trisha Barr and Teresa Delgado. This is Fangirls Going Rogue. Hey everybody, welcome to the world of cats. Otherwise known as Fangirls Going Rogue. We're here for episode 14, I believe, of Fangirls Going Rogue. Brought to you all of you and us and everybody by our friends and yours over at Rebel Force Radio. I'm your host, Teresa Delgado, and with me is my amazing co-host, who always keeps me in line, but somehow cannot keep my cats in line, Trisha Barr. Well, thank you. You're welcome. We have a really great show, and we've had some awesome voicemails and emails from people which is just amazing to us but we have a lot of stuff to talk about a lot of great content this episode so we're going to definitely get to those next episode and we appreciate everybody who sent in so we are not ignoring you but we want to make sure we start off the new year right with some listener voicemails we will get to you and but we just wanted to let you guys know that we said rudy won the contest and it was Rudy maybe sort of Zach Otto which sounds nothing like Rudy <laughs> it was a screen name yeah. and it's voicemail and I I'm I don't know like old old person so but we <laughs> you just call yourself an old person yeah I you're am. not I don't an old person well. you're, like, eh, eh, I can't hear you eh, it, say it again eh. my hearing aid's not working <laughs> I'm like Palpatine I can't hear you except <laughs> I really do hear you no um that was uh Zach Otto congratulations for winning that we wanted to make sure we got the right name yep and uh, now that we have your address and all that fun stuff we will be sending that out. But also, Zach um, sent us a picture, and we wanted, we'll wanted include it in our show notes, but he has built a Lego Star Wars nativity. How freaking cool is that? I, I think that nativity scenes are taking it up a not just year, I've noticed, but the Lego's awesomeness of his nativity scene probably really reigns supreme. So, Well, as a huge Lego fan myself, I think that's amazing. I've been contemplating for a while about trying to put together a Lego nativity, but it hadn't occurred to Star Wars Lego nativity or a geeky Lego nativity. So now I've got all kinds of ideas floating in my head. (laughs) So, Trisha, we have some of our friends here with us today. They're going to help us with our listener feedback and then also help us with the rest of the show. We just like to do Star Wars fangirl parties. We did this with Conchetta previously, right? So we thought, let's just talk about Star Wars with our friends. So I wanted to welcome Geek Girl Diva from the EW Star Wars Rebel community. Welcome. Hello. Yay. And then also we have Sarah Jedi Tink from Skywalking Through Neverland. Welcome, Sarah, to Fangirls Going Rogue. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of your podcast. I've been listening since the very beginning. Well, we've been meaning to have you on, and we thought that this would be a good time since we've had some news recently and um, some trailers. A trailer? Trailer. trailer. <laughs> I have no yeah. idea what you're talking about. I, I Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah. Sorry. I, I haven't think, seen any trailers. I haven't seen any either. No. Like, <laughs> I haven't seen a single trailer 50,000 times. <laughs> I know. When it was hit 110 million, I'm like, well, yeah. I have at least 50 of those. <laughs> exactly. Well, does it mark like every view that you do on it or is it just like, does it mark oh, you yeah. as one viewer? No, it marks every view you do. Oh, I'll okay, sometimes, so then, yeah. I'll sometimes post a podcast episode on YouTube and then I'll be like, oh, I'll refresh. So it just has a couple of views already. <laughs> That's why my YouTube videos have so many views because I watched myself. All right. (laughs) Good to know. Okay, so our first email is from Richard Garrett. And he asked a lot of good questions in regards to the trailer, which gave us an idea that we would use this email to discuss the trailer. So Richard says, I am not a writer. 
but I wanted to write you guys anyway. He says, I like the Andy Circus voiceover. I liked seeing John Boyega's character in Stormtrooper uniform on a sand planet. It begs many questions. Is he defecting? Is he in disguise and escaping? Where is he? Who is chasing him? So before we go any further, let's just tackle that. <laughs> There's enough questions in there to last us two hours. Does anybody think that he's in disguise and escaping or defecting from the Empire? Can I give my... my- yeah snarky answer first and then absolutely okay. so my first answer that i kind of always want to be i don't know and <laughs> that's the point that, that's I my answer too no and i don't want to know until i watch the movie <laughs> because like i thought that was cool i mean my first thought if i was gonna guess and if i was putting a my spin on it is t- probably different than a lot of people's spin on it but i almost thought to myself like i was like well ooh, maybe he's a a, a stormtrooper and he's like hearing voices and now he's really confused you that's know awesome that's like, amazing what if, what if he's feeling something of the force or he's hearing something and now he's like what the <laughs> so I, I didn't even go to like, is he defecting or like, you know, is he in disguise? I went to what if this is one of those dudes who just like something happened and, and he was a good little empire dude running around and then something has come to light. So, but honestly, I'm like, I, yeah. So part of me is like, I don't know. And then I was like, I don't know. That's kind of fun. I want to not know. Yeah. I'm actually a lot like you. I saw it, saw sand, went, that's cool. He looks scared. And that's about as far as I got. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to say, I hate sand. <laughs> <laughs> it gets everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's got, if they don't use that line and they've got all that sand, it's just, oh, it's wasting time. You know, potential. what if they don't? If, I hope they don't, though, because really, I'm sorry, but because no, C3PO did that, I'll be like, what no. If, what if they have somebody say, I love sand? It gets everywhere. <laughs> that would be even better. So, Sarah, so they your finally thought. made these stormtrooper outfits sandproof. You know? uh, yeah, they really should. Yeah, my thought was when I first saw him, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is the Star Wars trailer, and there's our first character." Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I I'm like Geek Girl Diva, and you guys, I, I don't really want to read too much into it. I'm just excited to see these little bits of the trailer, and and I want to see what the next trailer is going to hold. Right. Um, well, Trisha, your turn. I just thought my thought was sort of what Richard goes on to say, and he's just awesome to see new stormtroopers stormtrooping. <laughs> so that was, you know, that was his thought. And it, I just love the, the expression on John Boyega's face. Yeah. So it, it, that was just sort of one of those priceless, uh, it actually reminded me of uh, Han Solo's expression a few times in A New Hope where he was like, oh, man, dude. Actually, the expression he had in the Stormtrooper outfit when he's like, why am I chasing these Stormtroopers? What am I doing? <laughs> yeah. And before we move on, like, we don't have this written down, but I'm going controversial for a minute. So mm. bear with me. And I have a feeling I know what everybody on this panel is going to say, but... um. Black Stormtrooper, problem, not a problem. Sarah? <laughs> um, not a problem at all. Didn't even cross my mind. Me either. Trisha? Uh, I think not a problem. Yeah. And um, Geek Girl Diva, I would assume. I would, I would, I would, I would, not a problem. No. The first time I heard that, and I was like, why? I why know. is that a problem? Yeah. And, yeah. So really, my first thought when I saw him, at first I was like, oh, that's who that is. I didn't really, I have not seen Attack the Block, so I, I need to do that. And so, I, like, I knew kind of the name John Boyega, but I was like, oh, that's him. Okay. You know, plus he looks hot. That was right? Like, like, he looks like super hot and hot. Like, it's yeah. Kind of a... You know, black, no, yeah. The, I was I was really surprised. I mean, the whole, the whole um, reaction to that twofold. I mean, okay. Like there were people and the first thing, you know, when they first came up and it was definitely split into two camps. It was it was split into the well, that's not canon because stormtroopers are clones. And the other one, of course, was unfortunately more of a racist thing. And I saw both sides, like literally I saw both of the the different kind of reactions. And, you know, one of them was just icky. (laughs) The other one, I was like, that's not logical. 
So. Right. Well, you know, I immediately jumped to the fact that there's still racism in our culture, unfortunately. So there was that. But then there were the people that were on the part about the clones, and I was sitting here throwing stuff at the wall going, Stormtroopers are not clones! They're not clones! They got phased out after Revenge of the Sith! Why do you not read? You know, because Stormtroopers are not clones! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that I think that unfortunately there's there's certain things people lean on. Like I know that every oh gosh, talk about line. You know, you throw a line into a movie like, "Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper?" And somehow people take that to mean that all the stormtroopers look the same and thereby are the same height, as opposed to maybe the Empire has a height requirement. You know, right. <laughs> so I was like. Yeah, but I mean, maybe the clone thing, I can even I can even take it as that there are people who might not really get the 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 stormtroopers have been phased out. But it's the that people were so adamant about it, like that's not possible because and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. It's the Star Wars universe. Come on. (laughs) What do you mean? That's not possible. Uh, it's like it's not real life, people. Everything is possible. Yeah. Remember, Darth Maul was cut in half, yeah. and he came back to life as a spider. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so clearly, <laughs> black stormtroopers can't. Really, I don't remember that. <laughs> wow, I have phased certain things out of my memory. Clearly, <laughs> yeah. It, it was R- Richard goes on. He's just really and enjoying just his reaction and i'm enjoying his reaction okay. he went he went on to say daisy ridley looking very padme leia on her really cool speeder tractor is she fleeing is she racing to tell someone about something she found then he's asked about oscar isaacs in the cockpit of an x-wing shot is a very a new hope yes indeed. And yes mm-hmm. yes Agreed. and his favorite the x-wings flying that was across my the favorite water. Can I just say, ha- Trisha, that you just skipped like my whole favorite part of the trailer because you skipped the part about rotate? Oh, I about rotate. Is this? The- I sk- I skipped the line. Yes, I skipped. Rotate. <laughs> rotate. rotate. The ball rotate droid. is the ball droid. Well, oh. I don't know if that's his real name. But R-O-T-8. I have I have I've heard rotate. I've heard beach ball droid. I've heard I've heard R-D-O. soccer ball droid. I've heard yeah. soccer fo- soccer droid. I've heard or soccer ball. I've, there's been a million, but I really I, like ROT8. Yeah. I have to say, though, and this is just my wild theory, and I'm probably totally wrong, but my first thought, I'm not kidding, I didn't think that the ball was attached to the droid. And so, like, I, if somebody said something about servos and something, and I'm like, I, that head is not attached to the body. And so I kept thinking it was like it was like the head of the droid on a ball. Rolling around on a ball, like maybe that's not even the droid's body. My engineer brain actually went to, well, he maybe he can hover, but he doesn't want to expend too much energy. So sometimes he uses that ball as to lower his uh, <laughs> ah. energy expansion. Uh, yeah, I heard FIFA. FIFA was what some people call them, too. Yeah. And I, I still contend because there were some people who didn't like the ball droid, which I don't know why, because he's the cutest thing yeah, ever. He's but great. I think the I think the droid makers were all going. How are we going to make that stand up? Yep. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't see anything connected to the head of the body. So basically, I was looking at like suspensor technology. So I'm like, okay. Like I thought it was cool, but I guess yeah, when you have a little droid like that, it it really can go pretty much anywhere. I was thinking and, it's so cute and cuddly, and I want one. And I, what you know, they're going to make a plush version of that. Okay, well they better make a plush version of Kit War first, and then they <laughs> can go make one of Rotate. <laughs> yes, Kit were Speaking of Ball Droid and Daisy Ridley's tractor pod or whatever it is, and the X-Wings, which I had to put up on our Fangirls Going Rogue Facebook page banner because the X-Wings are cool. In Today, in Variety, they had the recap of Bob Iger's discussion at their breakfast this morning. Ooh. And he talked a little bit about the amusement parks. And that, of course, we're going to see Star Wars in the amusement parks. And it's going to be stuff from the sequel trilogies because he thinks that the people coming in the parks need to be able to relate to it as what they're seeing now. And so I thought, what do you guys think of that? That we're going to see some new things in the park that really tie into the to the movies that are coming out. I think that makes a whole lot of sense because 
at one point they had a whole Star Wars land fleshed out already, but it was all based on um, the old trilogy. And so when they announced that um, Disney was buying Star Wars and and then these new movies are coming out, they kind of took a step back, the Imagineers, and said, well, wait, maybe we should rethink this and make a new Star Wars land based on the new movies that are coming out. And the, so, so this just ties in with what we kind of already knew as a Disney Parks aficionado. <laughs> so I, I think it's a good it's a good move. Yeah, no, I do too. I think that one of the things that I think a lot of people like to go to the parks for is to see what they've seen in theaters, i.e. Frozen right now. Um, And it's so popular that everything is packed up for Frozen. I mean, Sarah, you can probably tell me what the wait times for Anna and Elsa in Disneyland are. But like and over here on the other side of the country, we're still pushing two, three hours. I heard Um, six hours. uh, It's been that high. I would say on average, it's probably two, three hours. Yeah, they've actually made it so it's fast pass only over here. So you can only get fast passes. There is no standby line because it just gets too long. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so something else that was said in this um, Variety article um, is that Iger says that he keeps telling J.J. Abrams this is a $4 billion movie. Well, the $4 billion figure comes from what Disney paid for the franchise. Exactly. Um he says, we need to treat this very special. It's an unbelievable privilege and unbelievable responsibility to take a jewel and treat it in a way that is respectful of its past but brings it into its future. The early reaction to the trailer, which was 88 seconds um, and really included just 39 seconds of footage, it's been viewed over 110 million times. And and that's in addition to 40 million views of spoofs that have been created around the footage. He also admitted that they didn't, they were nearly about to not release a trailer at all. Abrams is known for wanting to keep footage of his films under wraps, but the rabid Star Wars fan base mm-hmm. prompted Disney to come up with the brief introduction of what the new film would look like. So I say good on you, Disney, because we were dying. I think also <laughs> part of it, I really do think that part of it, the trailer came out in response to the, the leaks that were coming off of the set. I really feel like somewhere it was kind of like, okay, okay, y'all need to calm down. Here, here, here's something. Here, here's something to chew on. Quit, here, go. Quit, <laughs> quit dropping things out of our movies, you know, yep. when we're not ready for you to see them. Here's something we put out. <laughs> You know, you have to give rabid fans something to gnaw yep, on. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what it was. I think they were like, OK, we what was the most recent thing? There was something that got dropped, like leaked. And it was just like, oh, gosh. And I can't remember what it was. But yeah, I, that was my set, my set, my set, my thought on it. it was like, OK, would you guys just calm down, please? Here's something. Leave us alone. Let us make our movie. I look forward to enjoying the Star Wars, whatever they put in the park and including buying plushy Bolly droids. You know, if they start making uh, ball droid sumsums, we're all in trouble. Oh, we're in big trouble. <laughs> yes. Ball droid sims, we're so in trouble. And I, I did want to say something just going back to what you're talking about, about them making a new, you know, the, basing the Star Wars land off the new movie, which, I mean, personally, I think that I see that there are some people that are kind of like taken aback by that. And I don't know if, I mean, for me personally, you know, Disneyland is, is, it bothers me every once in a while when Disneyland becomes kind of the marketing arm of the other uh, other projects, and that's just me personally. But I also think that it's because for me growing up, you know, Disneyland is, was this place where all of these things were already there, and it didn't occur to me as a kid that in some way, like all of you know, Fantasyland really is marketing for all of the movies. You know what I mean? Like, it was just like, these are these things that were there and you could go and you could experience them. And so every once in a while, when I feel that little kind of like push of that, it's more than just a ride for everyone to experience. It kind of throws me. But then like they did, I was really reticent, believe it or not, on Star Tours. And then, of course, I walked I walked inside. I was like, well, OK, <laughs> I'm happy, you know. So, I mean, I think that I think that whatever they do with it. The one thing we, that I kind of told myself was, well, don't forget the old the old trilogy. A lot of the old trilogy elements are in this new trilogy. I mean, you have Han, Luke, and Leia. You have the Falcon. You have, I mean, so right there, you've got a tie into the old trilogy. So there are definitely a lot of elements that are going to be there, and maybe that'll help kind of people that are 
worried about losing the old school. Does that make sense? It does. It makes perfect sense. Because I so, want to ride the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, I think we all, we all and do. I would be able to walk through it. I like, want to ride on it. Wouldn't it be cool like if they had like a Star Tours thing, but you're on the Falcon? And like if you could do a thing where you could be in one of the tur- like one of the gun turrets. I'm like, oh, I want to shoot stuff. So, you know, that's I think we all want to just play cowboy. Let's go ahead and ask you guys our traditional two questions that we ask everybody that comes on the show. What does being a fangirl mean to you? Well, I think being a fangirl kind of means you're you're part of something greater than yourself. So it's it's kind of like the force. When you meet another fangirl, it's like you intuitively understand and accept each other immediately. You don't have to explain anything. You just know that you're kindred spirits and I just think that, that that's what it means to be a fangirl. She used one of my favorite words, kindred spirit. <laughs> it's all good. Yes, it's because you can meet in the front of the park and all scream at each other, which I think happened uh-huh. last year at Star Wars Week. <laughs> I think it did. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, you just feel that immediate connection. It's like the force is pulling you together. And because you're girls or women, you just you understand each other in a way that is even more profound. Being a woman is weird. I prefer to be a girl. I don't know why. Just <laughs> sidebar. Um, I don't know if I screamed. I may have flailed. I, I think so. You were worried about losing your phone, but but after that, well, flailed, okay, I did was lose flailing my phone. Then. I yeah. did lose my phone. Okay. <laughs> and, Ther- and Teresa's pretty pretty good with with keeping the phone and walking and doing all that stuff. So that's epic. If the phone is almost flying. I can't help <laughs> that it fell out of my pocket on the Toy Story ride, okay? It fell out of my pocket. Oh, yeah. That was, that was I forgot the, the phone really almost went bye-bye. It went for another round. I have <laughs> lost my phone at Disney in three of the four parks. Wow. And Do gotten it back you how each to tether your phone to yourself while you're I got there it back or put it in a pocket? Time. I got it back in time. That's all I can say. Magic of Disney or something. But um, it has not escaped me in Animal Kingdom yet. So, Well, uh, you better hope it doesn't. There's a few places there you wouldn't want it to get lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, Geek Girl Diva, what does being a fangirl mean to you? Oh, gosh. That's a hard one. Okay. So, I think. For me, it's a little bit different in the sense that I, I use, I use fangirl because I don't know how any other way to explain like what I am because it's it's it took me a really long time and I mean like like a really long time to figure out that not only was I not a freak for liking the things I liked, but there were other people who liked the things I liked. So it took me a really, really long time. And then it was the kind of thing where I found that I really I, – I was able to express myself and talk about the things I liked and that there were other people who liked them as much as I did and that it wasn't just being – it was about being – more than just a fan in my expression like you can be a fan of something and be like that's so cool or whatever but the part of me that goes jumping up and down like physically or flailing of arms because I'm so excited about something that it that it it fundamentally changes the way I feel that to me is what being a fangirl is like it's that it's that ability to just completely let go and enjoy something and and be excited about it and not have to worry about whether you look like a dork. You're going to look like a dork. That's okay. <laughs> and and the the you know like I, I there's been I mean when I first started on Twitter and it was like I chose you know, we were like when I chose Geek Girl Diva and there was this whole conversation back then and we a lot of the a lot of the gals that were kind of starting to show up on social media and stuff and we, there were these questions well why do we call ourselves girls you know why do you say fan girl why don't you say fan women and and for me i was like well first of all i hate referring to myself as a fan uh, what do you say a fan female a fa- like to me it just <laughs> woman was not like i'm like okay yes i'm a woman i mean i'm a grown woman but i hate saying fa- i mean fan woman just sounds weird sounds weird the and, word woman is weird. Yeah. It's a weird word. 
Like, I'm fine with it. I love being one of them. But when it comes to my being a fan, I'm like, I'm not a fan woman. I'm not a grown up about that. I'm a fan girl. And so that was kind of where I think I we embraced it. And not only did we, I think it was a way of kind of saying, you know, no, I'm not going to be what you think I should be about this. I'm going to be what I want to be about this. And I want to call myself, I want to be a fan girl and a geek girl and a girl because you know what? I get to be five, you know, <laughs> I get to be five and be excited about this. I don't need you to tell me that I should be an adult about it. But also I think it just, it just kind of works. I mean, fangirl, Plus, everybody's been using fanboy for years. I mean, I people have been using fanboy. Fan man. Well, but I mean, <laughs> fanboy was the term. It was always fanboy. And actually, one of the things that uh, I got into it, <laughs> one of my, one of my, somebody who turned out to be a friend, um, but uh, uh, Jeff Boucher, who used to write over at, um, at the LA Times, and he wrote a thing, and it's all about da 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 for the fanboy. And I actually said to him, I'm like, why don't you, just, why fanboy? Oh, not fangirl. There's lots of us out here, you know? And so I think that was part of it was we had this term for the guys, but now we had to have a term for the girls. Yes. And I like that media is more and more starting to put fanboys and fangirls yeah. in, in articles because it used to just be fanboys or, and not, it, not just fans, but just fanboys. And I, I, you know, I was always like, well, uh, I'm not a fanboy. You know, a lot of the reactions on Twitter to the to the trailer were, I feel like an eight year old again, mm-hmm. and I think that's that was what they were hoping for, right? So mm-hmm. it, when you say I'm I'm a fanboy or fan girl, it's sort of like I want to be my inner child, where it was just the story in me, and I want that cool Millennium Falcon or Tie Fighter thing to play with, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that's on the screen. So uh, <laughs> that leads to our. Next, our second question that we always ask everybody. And so, Jedi Tink Sarah, what is one of the underrated or underappreciated things about Star Wars? question is so hard, and I was thinking about it earlier today because you had sent me the show notes. <laughs> and I, I, was, <clears throat> I was like, I, I don't know, because everything is so revered in Star Wars. So my answer is, I don't think anything is underrated. I think everything is just so hyped or revered and not just the movies themselves, but the toys, the collectibles, the concept art, the soundtrack, the music. I mean, what other movies have have the a concept art has become so popular? You know, like who knows the name of Ralph McQuarrie? Well, a lot of people, mostly Star Wars fans, but like try looking at the concept art for any other movie. Uh, no one cares about that. Um, and also mm. people who, have, you know, people who had bit parts, are now able to pay the bills just by showing up at conventions and signing their autograph. So uh, to me, I don't think anything is underrated. I think everything about Star Wars, um, I don't know, it has, has, has its due. Good answer. And Geek Girl Diva. I'm going to... Mm, man, I keep sounding so esoteric tonight. <laughs> I should have had a shot of whiskey before this. Um... I'm going to go back maybe to the original trilogy, and I think it's because that the original trilogy kind of speaks to me more. And I think maybe the thing that I find about it that maybe is not underrated, but is maybe not necessarily quite grokked by everybody, is how... um, how inclusive... And kind of, I want to say welcoming, but like, I guess the way to look at it is, it's like, here's the Star Wars universe, here's the episode, you know, here's, here's A New Hope, and you're watching this movie. And the, the beginning when you're watching this movie, and the first thing you know, there's all of these, there's all these fighters, and there's all this stuff going on, and then there's these droids, and then there's these little creatures, and then there's this moisture farm, and there's all this stuff going on, and, and, and it, you just accept it. Like you just buy it. There's no question. It is what it is, and you're just there. And I think, in a way, the thing that to me that's that's not necessarily always kind of gotten is just how much skill there is in that, and how much magic there is in that. That we all fall, we all fell into this universe like it was just presented, and we just fell into it. And I think that you know, there's so many movies out there 
that try to do that, that try to get you to just automatically suspend disbelief and just go with it. Probably the closest movie that I've had that with recently was Guardians of the Galaxy. And I think it's why so many people compare, say it's this generation's Star Wars, because you just went with it. How did we go from little, you know, little kid gets taken by aliens? We set him in our world and then he's in another world and we totally buy it. And to me, it's the same thing with Star Wars. It never occurred to me just by saying a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you immediately tell me that it's this other place. And so everything that happens there is real and I don't have to question any of it. And to me, that was really cool. That's Teresa's underrated thing about Star Wars Uh is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So. yes. Yes, there is. I was thinking so, about the Guardians of the Galaxy thing and thinking about what I accepted the fact that he was taken by aliens. It was completely normal because he was playing awesome music, so I didn't care. Right. <laughs> right. I was like, I was like, sweet music, and he's dancing on some random oh. planet because that's <laughs> <me. laughs> yeah. It made sense. It, just, it worked. It made, made sense to me. I'm like, that's what I would do. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I would completely do that. So we're going to get into a little bit of Rebels and have a party. Woohoo! Where's my cupcake? Yeah, where's the cupcake? This this blogger, the Busy Spatula, she put up in in the show notes the Star Wars Rebel Party. Did you guys all see this Star Wars? Yeah. I mean, I I think this is fantastic. I saw the Zeb cake pops and just about died. Mm Mm-hmm. That picture is made for Pinterest. I saw this and I saw everybody's reactions to it. And I'm going to be the bad guy here. I was like, that's cool. All right. (laughs) I'm done. And I think it's because, like, I don't eat dip with chips. Yes, that sounds weird. No, it doesn't. I I don't either. (laughs) I, uh, I think the names are funny. I don't eat burritos. I can break this down for you. I do not like food that's mixed together. So, like, I don't eat stews and I don't eat just stuff that's all mixed together. Like, if it's like a taco, I've got to have layers that I can see the different stuff so that I understand what's in it. You can't just give me, like, a thing of mush and go eat this because I won't. (laughs) Does it bother you when your food touches? Oh, it does. I can't. I can't. (laughs) Okay, so I have a fun little bit of uh, a fun little bit of trivia I heard. Apparently, that is the um, that's one of the earmarks. Of uh, of being a, a, a sociopath. Oh, sweet. <laughs> you can't handle it when your food touches. <laughs> you all know me, so <laughs> I may not know where you live yet. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I, my, my sister is totally the throw a party like this for her kids because she wow. did the Frozen party and she had the pop you know, the pop cakes, like the Zeb pop cakes. So I just, this is like a total, if you have kid things, definitely. But sometimes, you know, when we be fangirls and fanboys, we do kiddie things too. So I sent this to my my sister and my mom right away. I'm like, guess what your next party is going to be? So, well, but one of my favorites was actually the Inquisit Tortilla Chips with Dual Dip. But I do like to make dips. So that was fun for me and just see all the little ideas that this, I mean, it, all these creative ways that people, uh, you know, to fan art or fan recipes and all these other things. So it's always fun for me to see these. If I, yeah. to, if I have to say, it's not so much like I, I didn't personally kind of like, you know, cut, dive onto the food so much, but that's because, and I don't know if you guys know Just Jen. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So like just, I, I'm unfortunately spoiled because I've, been able to partake of just Jen's cupcakes and she makes the princess Leia cupcakes. Now we're all jealous. And, and, and yeah. Oh, and so and when she does her parties and she's got her Yoda cookies and all her other stuff. So I think it just has to do also with what kind of stuff you want to eat. And I'm sorry, but I'd much rather have the dessert table laid out in front of me. <laughs> well, like, I, I, I like the, um, the yogan fruit juice, although I don't still don't understand what a yogan is. Um, so I don't know what it's what like a yogurt? star fruit. Like it's Yo- like yeah, a yogurt. star fruit. Wasn't that the little fruit that they had to get? No, to that bring... was the um uh oh. oh gosh, and I only want to say Mirakuru it's a, and of course it's a, my arrow. It's a Melu run. Melu run. Yeah. Melu run. Thank you. You're welcome. Which, I'm you... sorry, I nippled fruit on a on a on a <laughs> show confuses me. 
<laughs> but I like the I like the the cane and lightsaber kebabs and things yeah. like that. Well, I like the yogurt fruit juice because it seems like it would be something that came from Lothal rather than just a play on a character name or play on words to make the food. Mm-hmm. Tell so, you what, that's why I like if, that. I, if I'm getting yogurt fruit juice, there's going to be some extra stuff inside that yogurt <laughs> fruit juice. Special sauce. There better be. Uh-huh. There better be some yogurt vodka in that fruit juice. <laughs> Yogan fruit juice at Disneyland when they make all the upgrades. Yeah, really? Could we please? Oh, God. You know, it's not really bad enough that I get alcohol at California Adventure in downtown Disney. Let's not let me have it in the park. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be dangerous. But if I had if I had kids, this is totally something that I would do. You know, something themed like this for sure. Even if even not having kids, I would still do something like this. If my Star Wars <laughs> friends lived anywhere near me. I was going to say, I'd throw a theme party yeah. for this stuff now. Forget kids. The problem is nobody <laughs> lives near me, so yeah. can't do it. Can't do it. You know what? I well, I don't know. For my thirtieth birthday party, I had a slumber party and it was tangled themed, and we did all that. We had like all the tangled food and everything. It was awesome. Well, okay, here <laughs> I'm throwing this down to you guys. My thirtieth birthday is next March. Who wants to come and have a theme party with me? Because I don't We're have any it. friends. Oh, fun! Wait a minute. Where do oh. you live? I live in Tampa, Florida. How do you not have any friends in Tampa that likes what? Well, I mean, there's people out. around, but, like, you guys all live, like, elsewhere. That's a lot the of story of friends. my life. Yeah. That's, like, it's been my life since I was first started on AOL. Oh, like, man, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding? Day. Dude, I'm, like, all my friends have always been other places, and then, you know... <laughs> Back to my remember the day of days of six hundred dollar phone bills because I was talking to people across the country. Oh, oh yeah, I had somebody wow. ask me the other day, "Are all your friends online?" And I yes. sadly had to say, <laughs> "Yeah, I have, I have <laughs> some. I have some in real life, but I met them online, so I don't know what to tell you." <laughs> so one of the reasons that we wanted to have Geek Girl Diva on was she was inspired to write this awesome post about. Star Wars Rebels and the A plus on the Bechtel test. So do you want to just, you know, share, well, you know, it's going to be in the show notes, but just share kind of why you were inspired to write the piece. I wrote the post. I actually asked if I could do it. I, it was one of those where um, I, I really like Rebels. Like, I don't, I, I don't know what it was. I, I have to admit that I have to get caught up on the Clone Wars. Like, I don't know if it was just where I was at the time, but for some reason, Rebels just caught my attention and when I first started watching it, and and Hera's my absolute favorite character, without a doubt, hands down, favorite character. And I just was really kind of noticing that Hera and Sabine are two very well-rounded, interesting characters. And for me, I was just, I mean, I just knew I liked it. Like, I'm just like every week, and I'm enjoying the show. And then I started thinking about it, and I was like, oh, Bechdel test. And I hear about it all the time, but then I was like, wait a minute. Oh my gosh, this totally passes. And then as I started thinking about it, I realized not only does it pass it, it absolutely passes it and goes beyond. Like not only does the show have, you know, two strong female characters who both have names, not only names, but full names, first and last, but they, they interact with each other frequently and they have yet to talk about a guy. And then there was this whole episode out of darkness where they had one of my favorite kind of action sequences I've ever seen in anything. So what really happened was it just kind of struck me that that's so cool because when I was, when I was a kid, I didn't have shows like that. Like I didn't have shows where I could see, you know, two women who were both, you know, really, really capable and, um, and awesome who did stuff and who I could look at and see positively. And even still completely honest, I don't see it a whole lot in the stuff I'm watching you know, out in the world. It's not that I don't see capable women. I just don't see them working together a ton. Um, So that was pretty much where it started. It started with just realizing that and then realizing that because I enjoy the show so much, I wanted to kind of talk more people into watching it because it's really easy sometimes, I think, to look at a show like that and discount it or think, oh, that's for kids or think, oh, I don't know, it's, you know, it's whatever. And so I wanted to kind of write it from the point of view of, hey, you know what, you may not think this is something you're going to dig, but you may really like this. 
That's a great angle. And and that's for me, it was more about I, I kind of have this tendency of if I think something's really cool, I want other people to think it's really cool, not because it makes me look good, but because they get to enjoy it. I You make a, a, an important point about the Bechdel test. It, is, it shouldn't be a be all and end all to storytelling. We had Greg Weisman on our last show and he actually mentioned the Bechdel test and he He's much more, um, how do you say, like you noted that the characters have first and last names. That was one of the things that he, you know, talked about, mm-hmm. them all developing these characters so well. And when Hera feels so real to me, when even from the first moment on screen and all the other characters, they've all quickly come to life, which really speaks to how well they worked out the characters before they ever started writing them. And, but at least... What gives me a lot of comfort is that they're talking about the Bechtel test because it isn't about necessarily passing it, but at least having the characters in place for the potential to pass the Bechtel test. And that was the problem with a lot of stories from, you know, the my, my childhood. If I look back on things that I liked, mm-hmm. you could some of those stories you couldn't even see it passing, which is one of the great things, even changing like Starbuck into a female character on Battlestar Galactica when it got re, you know, rebooted, mm-hmm. it gives a chance for that Bechdel test to, to be passed in the show. Whereas previously it was a bunch of guy fighter pilots who mm-hmm. couldn't ever, you know, pass the test. So I, I, that's why I loved the piece and just loved how you brought it up. Sarah, we haven't gotten to talk to you about what do you love about Rebels and this does this article speak to you? Oh, yeah. In fact, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you wrote that, Geek Girl D, because I, I really enjoyed reading it. And I, I really liked the part where you bring up that Sabine knows that Ezra has a crush on her. But she hasn't really even acknowledged it on the show. I don't even. I don't even know if she real. I mean, I honestly, I don't even know if she knows so much as it's that that if she does, she's so not dealing with it. Like it right, hasn't even. Right. Like she's just. It's on her periphery. Like what ifs. And exactly. Well, I <laughs> like think she, the age. Yeah. You mentioned their age difference, uh-huh. and that she's older, and so it makes total sense that she'd be like, yeah, but she's not acknowledging anything because he's just too young. You know, yeah, and besides, so uh, yeah, I thought, and I loved. I mean, I love that he's like, "I'll save you," and then she's. I'm like, "Ha ha ha!" <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, awesome. that was pretty cool. So yeah, before this article, I I was just enjoying the dynamic between those two characters, but it, now this article, your article, makes me really think that yeah, Sabine is a strong character just on her own, and she doesn't need you know a man or a boy or you know even Aladdin to define her. Uh, <laughs> oh good i'm not the only one who's been that <laughs> no <laughs> Every, oh my god he's aladdin um yeah i think Teresa. yeah oh, Teresa, what did, did you get to read the article what did you think i did get a chance to read it and um i think that um one you write very well so oh, thank you yay for that um i think that I'm the, probably the only one that doesn't, that's not as behind Sabine as the rest of you to be. Like, you have no idea how much I wanted to be. But um, the episode with her and Hera and the way that she was behaving and kind of acting like a a spoiled brat child in my eyes, you know, that mm-hmm. and the just her whining and complaining and all that kind of stuff, it really rubbed me the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And um, I applaud Tia for her acting performance as a voice actor because she really did a good job in portraying, you know, that side of Sabine and that frustrated side of her. And I think that she did a wonderful job, but, you know, for the character as a whole, I think I expected her to be um, kind of a more mature 16 year old that could understand what was going on because the way that she was acting in those first few episodes, it really made me feel like she had really seriously been through some stuff and that she was kind of on the same like mental level as Hera. And I was really, really liking that. And then I got this twist that I kind of wish this now, you know, well, yeah, characters have to grow though. So she's a, She's a 16 year old, and I can tell you, 16 year old, I was admiral on some days, and I was really not admirable on others. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I know. My mom would agree with you're that. Talking <laughs> to a, you're talking to a high school teacher. 
You know, so I am, <laughs> I am fully aware. I think I had just gotten a different vibe from her to begin with. And so it was kind of like a shock to me that that was when I finally got some, you know, just sort of alone time with Sabine, that that's what I saw. Um, I did like how they brought her around at the end, but it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. So I'm still not a super huge Sabine fan. You know, I think that, I mean, I totally, I get what you're saying. And I do think that maybe it comes down to that, that they're really working on, they're setting up some, ba- some, some time to tell her story. Because when you look at it, there's really, we don't know much about her at all. Like at all. I mean, mm-hmm. we know she was at, so now we've discovered she was at the Academy, which, you know, I'm like, at first when she said she was, she, you know, when the whole thing came up and droids in distress and they were talking about how she was at the Academy and then she starts busting out with, you know, I forget now what language it was, but you know what I mean? Like, and then I thought, oh, well, that's a really good, like, cover. But then it turns out she really was at the Academy. So I think that they've, they haven't given us any real background on her. And so kind of what I took her, that, that more kind of, kind of, you know, a little bit bratty side, but also is that vulnerable side of where, you know, you get that, yeah, she's, she's a pretty sharp 16 year old, but she is 16 and that there, there's some part of her that is like still, that there's a, there's a kid under there that's been really damaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, and kids, and kids want to just fix, like she wants to fix it now. Like she just wants to make whatever is wrong. Right. And Hera is knows there's sort of a long con going on here because oh, I think Palpatine yeah. worked for a long time to get where he was. So they can't just rise if they just rise up and do what they're going to do. They're going to lose. Well, and so, not just that. I think she wants to be an adult. And if she's an adult, if they tell her, if they put her, if they bring yeah. her in on what's what the bigger plan is, then she's the adult too, right? I think yep. she feels like Good she's point. being left out, and so they don't yeah. think she's mature enough to handle it. That makes As a lot of sense. Do you know what I mean? So I think that that's part of it. I think that we're going to get more about her and when, and that Hera, because they have a really hard dynamic, I think. I mean, they have to figure out how to have a 14-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl mm-hmm. and yet not have Hera and Kanan be the mom and dad. Mm-hmm. Right. Because Kanan can't be, the, I already did this math, Kanan can't be the dad. Kanan's the big brother if he's anything, because if he's the dad, that's going to get creepy. Right, because he's only twenty eight. Right. So, <laughs> so it's like I think that they have a kind of a tough dynamic, but I do. I, I can see what you're saying about Sabine. There are times I want to punch Ezra mm-hmm. for <laughs> real. over the knee and be like, "No, no, go to your room. No supper for you." Uh, uh-uh. uh-huh. rattling <laughs> child. I just you think know. that I, I think that maybe, and it's possible that I may have done this. Heaven forbid. Um, I had extremely high expectations for Sabine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it didn't meet my expectations. So therefore, I was kind of like, well, like, dang. Yeah. I think the first time we saw her, we were all going, we're getting a Mando? <laughs> we're getting a, yeah. what? You know, like, we, what? yeah. Just remember if if like one of our earliest experiences was just the twenty two minute episode with Luke going, but I wanted uh, to go to conversation. We would probably be like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like, he didn't give us enough panic inverters. Okay, shut up. He didn't give us enough time to actually realize that he was very much a, a you know he was a little bit of a young man at that he was point. A poor boy. <laughs> He was a child. <laughs> so yeah, and good point. It you know so it's a it's funny. I actually like that about Luke Skywalker because as a child I didn't see that in him, <laughs> but as an adult I didn't. I just it made sense because and we forget that George Lucas is creating it for children. So sort of that kind of. Uh, and especially people who adults who saw the prequel trilogies and they're like, Anakin, ah, and they couldn't deal with the Phantom Menace, Anakin, you know, that he was kid. But kids who grew up watching those movies, they they like that character. They love the Phantom Menace. It worked for them. So it's always, you know, where you start in. So Me. hopefully we'll come back. We can come. Yes, we can come back in a year and say, well, what do you think now of Sabine? You know, did she get did she grow up? Did she get to be an adult? Is she evolving? I'm very curious about her. And we sort of in a back way did our character. Discussion. Yeah, we did. Yeah. 
Come on. Good job, everybody. Yay. And great. Any other thoughts from people on Sabine or Rebels before we wrap it up? Yeah, since I'm on Fangirls Going Rogue, I, I really like the fact that Sabine, uh, a female character, is the one who's responsible for creating that awesome Star Wars Rebels logo. Yes. 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 <laughs> and while we're talking about that, I just want to point yeah. out that if anybody wants a Firebird pendant, you need to go and check check out um, Meredith Funk. Um, oh. I think her store is Foxy Funk on Etsy because she makes laser cut acrylic jewelry and she's made the Firebird. And I hope I get mine soon because I ordered it. And uh, What's it called? Foxy I, Funk? I think it's Foxy Funk. I, I, I'm I saying this on the air without actually having it w- anything in front of me. Hold on. It will be on the, sh- it will be on the show notes. Okay. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I need some Christmas gifts. Yep, it is Foxy Funk. And she's done a purple one now, and she oh. has Star Wars logo ones, and she's got all kinds of stuff over there, so check it out. Yeah, and you can wear it with your, like, Firebird Her Universe t-shirt, mm-hmm. or you can wear it with you know, whatever you want to wear, or just maybe oh, with something that isn't it. isn't Star Warsy, but you can show your little flair, and someone will might figure out that you're a Star Wars fan. I like yeah. that fire. To see, I didn't even know to call it a Firebird, so you guys are already so much ahead of me. <laughs> I love that logo. I also love that she's the explosives expert. And <laughs> I love that we finally got in the last two episodes. I think it was Empire Day. She does the fireworks, and you finally get to see what she's really capable of when it comes to explosions. Because, yeah. I mean, Sarah, you and I are both fireworks freaks. We go to Disney all the time. <laughs> we love fireworks. Can you imagine Sabine fireworks over Magic Kingdom? That's what I've, or Disneyland, Sleeping Beauty's uh, Castle. Um, yeah, that's what I great. imagine Hallowish's fireworks are. You, you already know that's going to be it, right? Star Wars Weekend is going to be Sabine's fireworks. Yay. Spectacular. <laughs> 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 I, I I personally really I thought that the I thought that the um the whole thing in Out of Darkness with the with the Fairnox and the and the Rhydonium and that whole thing that was I thought that was so awesome mm-hmm. when they were setting all those explosions up but I'm just like Shh, this is awesome you know <laughs> like do that some more <laughs> well it up. was like it was like a buddy cop movie where they're like yeah. we got it we got it we got it oh um, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> I was kind of getting the, yeah, definitely the buddy cops, like, yeah. you know, type of vibe were like, oh, oh, maybe it's not happening. And they had, gr- the dialogue was great in that sequence. I've already <laughs> gone on record as begging Gentle Giant, please, then since they're making the animated maquettes, I was like, could we please get one of Hera and Sabine back to back firing oh. the blasters? <laughs> because I think that would just be amazing. Mm-hmm. Bookends. Yeah. Oh. Facing out. Oh. Here, don't touch my book. That's good. <laughs> Sure. Come up with an idea that's more expensive than the maquette. Ladies, we had a fabulous time, and we always want to make sure that people know how to find you. So, Geek Girl Diva, where can people find you on the the interweb? Pretty much you can find me under Geek Girl Diva. So, it's geekgirldiva.com, Geek Girl Diva on Twitter and Facebook and whatever. And Sarah? Yes, you can find me and my husband, Richard, on skywalkingthroughneverland.com, where we do our Star Wars Disney podcast. And, of course, you can find us on Twitter, well, at Skywalking Pod, or if you want to talk about fangirl things, I am at Jedi Tink, and you can find our podcast on um, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, all those fun podcast places. So um, thank you so much for having us on. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. I can't even tell you. I think it's so cool to, to that you even asked me to do this, and thank you. I really appreciate it. This has been spectacular, a fun discussion. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to chat with us on this. That was so much fun to have Geek Girl Diva and Jedi Tink on and discuss just being a fangirl and the crazy awesomeness, Star Wars Rebels, The Force Awakens teaser trailer. I love it when we can just have like a, you know, have our friends on and be able to talk and chat and laugh. It's best. It's best. We had an opportunity. Jimmy Mack put us in touch with Ann Newman from Rancho Obi-Wan, and we've already had Conchetta on from Rancho Obi-Wan. And I really wish Teresa had been able to be there because this was an amazing conversation. And 
Um, the only the only good thing was that we we're both old fangirls, so Teresa would have been able to remind us how old we were. See, you're welcome. That's why I wasn't there, because I would have been like, hey, remember when I wasn't born? Hey, remember when, when I wasn't alive? Exactly. So anyway... We'll just let you have a listen, and she's going to talk a little bit about Rancho Obi-Wan, and then we'll come back and talk about it. We have a special guest with us, Ann Newman, who is general manager of Rancho Obi-Wan. So welcome, Ann, to Fangirls Going Rogue. Hi, Tricia. Thanks for having me on. This is so exciting because it's your first podcast, and this is one of the things that we are out there. We want to give every fan a chance to talk about the amazing things they do to work on Star Wars. And Rancho Obi-Wan is literally one of the most amazing projects there is for Star Wars. Can you explain to people just real quick what Rancho Obi-Wan is? Well, Rancho Obi-Wan is the world's largest Star Wars collection, according to Guinness World Records. And it is, uh, the collection is owned by Steve Sansweet, who used to be Head of fan relations at Lucasfilm. A lot of people know him through that role, but um, he does own the world's largest Star Wars collection. And Steve and I turned uh, Rancho Obi Wan into an official nonprofit 501c3 museum in 2011. And we are now open to uh, people to book tours and come and see the collection. And We basically like to share everything that's here with everybody. I've never been, but I've seen pictures and anyone I ever hear talk about it, they're just in awe and amazed about just the collection that's there, just everything, things that we all know and love. And then there's, you've got things that people might not even know about. What's some of like the rarest thing you can think of or the strangest or maybe different things? (laughs) Well, there's there's everything for sure. Um, the strangest thing, and I feel the grossest thing, is a uh, foot cast from 1982 from a stuntman who worked on Return of the Jedi who broke his leg during the filming. And uh, he kept the cast because it's signed by Mark Hamill, Terry Fisher, um, Kenny Baker, all those things. And... Uh, he had it, and Steve got it somehow, and here it is. It is a cast. So that's, <laughs> that's one of the grossest things. <laughs> so Harrison Ford wasn't the first person to end up cast out and broken after no, making the stars. Not at all. <laughs> Obviously, you have to have passion to do this for Star Wars, and that's what we like to know. How did you get into Star Wars? Where? What do you? What do you remember being... What drew you in? Oh, well, uh, I was nine in 1977 when Star Wars came out, and I don't remember seeing it for the first time in the theater, but I all I know is that it was a part of my life from then on. And me and my little sister, Joni, she was six, we both loved Star Wars, and we played with the action figures, and we collected trading cards. It was with us, you know, until we became teenage girls. Then it kind of went away for us. But um, in 1999, I was turning my head. I was like, I don't want to see Star Wars again because I knew that if I saw another Star Wars, that I, it would just be the road, you know, you don't return. And it was that was the case. I saw it again, and it uh, has been a part of my life ever since. Oh, I love that. We're about the same age, so very similar memories for yeah. me. So- it's beautiful. I remember the trading cards. That was something that was sort of near and dear to my heart around that time that I just remember being, the, I'm not really a collector, but that was something that I really enjoyed. Yeah, uh, for sure. It was, uh, you know, because you could, it was the true trading card sense of the word when you were that age. And at that time, you went and you bought, you know, your 25 cent pack and then you sat down with your friends and you said, do you have that one? No, I don't need, I, I need that one. Can I have that one? Oh, you got two of those. I need one of those. And um, collectors these days don't particularly do that. And um, so it's good memories for that. I remember the little bit of bartering and a lot of times the ones that I like, some other people didn't like. So it always worked out well for me. Yeah. Yeah, so it was very social. 
pre-internet age, how you could share your fandom love. What does being a fangirl mean to you as far as being a, a fan and a girl of for Star Wars? Thinking about that, and for me, and I think it's been this way since the beginning, um, I've always kind of been um, in the in the behind the scenes of a lot of things for Star Wars. Um, I've only been to one convention as a as a fan, you know, just going. Um, so for me, it's really about giving opportunities to, for other people to experience the fandom. So, for instance, I worked for Rebel Scum for a while. I worked for Official Ticks for a long while, for seven years. And then I came to Rancho Obi-Wan. And uh, it's just always been about... What can I do to bring fandom to others? And that's what we do here at Rancho Obi-Wan, and uh, that just brings me great joy. Were you part of the all of the celebrations, part of that process, too, when um, when they were creating them? No, Steve. Uh, Steve invented those while he was at Lucasfilm, and uh, I did not go to Celebration 1. I went to Celebration 2 as a fan, and... Um, I've been to all the others except for Celebration Europe 1 um, as part of Official Fix or Branch of Obi-Wan. Wow, that's that's awesome. Celebration 3 was my first uh, oh. Star Wars convention. So. Yeah, and Celebration 3 was a great one, actually. I really enjoyed that one. It was, except for the cold, rainy day outside. <laughs> I know. Isn't that, isn't that the year that it snowed outside and people were waiting for George Lucas? Yes, because I went out of the hotel and I said, not even George Lucas is worth getting this cold and wet. And I went back in. And as it turned out, the a, a lot of people really were um, just didn't stand in line. And then people were able to get in uh, who they were just like, say, come on, come on, there's more room. So it turned out well for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember them moving the line inside at some point because they can't just let, you know, hundreds of people just sit out in the snow. Oh, yeah. I mean, you the line I remember to get in for that convention, I was going to find the end the first day when it opened. And it was like 15 minutes of walking to get to the end of the line. So yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of people. Yeah. No, I, I love the conventions. I, I think it's fun. And um, I really enjoy being behind the scenes and instead of in those lines. I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> so what is something we always challenge people with this question, but what is something you feel is underappreciated or underrated about Star Wars? You know, that's a really hard question. Um, and I really appreciate that. The word that comes to mind is the kitschiness of it all. Silliness, kitschiness. Um, people tend to take ownership um, of the of the stories and they get really involved and they get really concerned is the only word I can think of. And you know what? It's just a fun flick. You know, don't forget that it's just, it's just supposed to be, it's a fantasy. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be silly. It is kitschy. Some of the dialogue sucks. It's weird. I think people forget that a lot. (laughs) <laughs> it's just sort of part of part of it. Yes, have fun. Have yeah. fun with it all. <laughs> yes, don't be so serious, man. It's okay. It's all okay. Uh, I love that's a great answer. We get the best answers when we ask. People are always like, ah, uh, and then we get great answers. So <laughs> it's always fun to see everybody's little side of it. And yeah. I love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys had... Um, your second annual gala mm-hmm. was it in September? Yeah, this is yes. when we started sort of talking about getting you on the show. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Because we want to hear. We want to. Conchetta was on. We got to hear a little bit before it was coming out, but we wanted to hear a little bit of what happened there. Oh, okay. Um, well, first of all, we we're, we have an annual gala, which is a fundraiser for Rancho Obi Wan and. Like any other museum in the world, you have to raise money in order to pay for insurance and utilities and stuff like that. And uh, we only do it once a year, and it it pretty much helps us get through the the beginning of the next year, which is great. As far as the whole fundraising, there's a silent auction and a live auction. 
and there are games, and all of the uh, proceeds from those go to help us um, pay the bills. We like to make it a party. We like to throw parties, and uh, we have food and dessert, and we have a bar, and uh, we have some entertainment. This year we had a belly dancer dancing with John of the Hut, which is really cool. And basically we we shuttle people in. People don't park here, and so you could stay at your hotel and get a free ride back and forth, which is awesome. And um, we just want it to be a really fun time because these uh, the people who come to our gala are really our our major donors. They really fund us for about half the year, so we just want them to have like the best time ever. We tried to have some celebrities this year. Our um, we had a lot of Lucasfilm people come here, so you get to talk to people that you wouldn't normally talk to. And, of course, talk to Steve in a more personal manner than you normally would. And there were about uh, 100 people here this year. Oh, wow. It, it's always – I it's one of those things that one day I'll go to. I, I keep seeing it, and I see all the cool things are up there and the pictures. and Yeah, um, it's a fun time. And, and we've already scheduled our next one, and members can already purchase tickets online on our member store. And it's for October 24th, 2015. And wow. The weekend before Halloween. So we are theming it uh, the Halloween. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sure to be a good time. And we already have uh, a special exhibit planned, um, which are in crates sitting outside our buildings with a tarp on them. So I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it is a cool exhibit. So we've got... We're already planning a year in advance. That, I mean, people probably don't understand how much work it takes to run, you know, it's not not for profit. Just, I know the paperwork is enormous to go through just to get to that point, but then to keep it going and supported and do events like these are just major planning undertakings. So it, it must be one of those. I mean, you're, that's really cool. You get to work on Star Wars stuff and yeah. and take care of it. I love it. So how can people who want to, like, participate and be a donor to Rancho, Rancho Obi-Wan do that? If you go to our website, RanchoObiWan.org, um, there is a uh, annual membership page. Um, membership is basically a donation of $40 a year. And with the membership, you get access to the online store where you can buy T-shirts and tour tickets. And you get 10% off the store. And you get a thank you gift, um, which is a patch and a letter signed by Steve and a little card with your name on it. And um, it is 100% tax deductible, depending on your specific situation. Like I say, it's $40 a year, and we always take... uh, more donations, if you'd like to do that, you can do that online as well. That's fantastic. And it's end of the year, people. So if you want to give to charity and get your tax rate off, now's the yep. time to do it. <laughs> yep, yep. And you can also, um, if you go on there, you can say, hey, this is a gift for somebody. We're coming up on the holiday season. And um, a lot of people give to charities, ask gifts in other people's names. And, of course, we do that. And um, we... You know, if you wanted to come and have a birthday party at the museum, you can do that. Um, That's a fantastic idea. Yes, we have had several birthday parties, and we've we've had one wedding reception, and we have another wedding booked for next year. We uh, do corporate, like, outbreak sessions. If you want to bring your company to a really unique place to, you know, do some brainstorming, you can do that. So those are the other ways that we um, we raise money. I need my company to do a brainstorming. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it, 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 it's certainly mentally stimulating, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All the items you have, do you, uh, are they, like, do you have to catalog them? And do you have, like, a huge database? How do you keep track of them? Well, my my professional history is I'm a database uh, developer. I 
worked in all kinds of databases when I was younger, Oracle, and um, I finally, I, all I do is work in a program called FileMaker, and I have a specific database that I wrote for Rancho Obi-Wan, and uh, I came here to catalog the collection, and we feel it's probably only about 20% complete, and uh, <laughs> I, I try to do it on occasion. It's it's really overwhelming, actually. And right now we've got about a hundred thousand pieces in the catalog, but there's there's so much more, so much more. Okay, so here's where we talk about there's things that you could you can be like um, you know we talk about science and technology. You had essentially this cool sort of computer based career, and you ended up being able to work in Star Wars on it. Yeah, that's right. And um, you know, I like I like to think that Rancho Obi Wan is a place where, you know, we have a lot of school tours with kids, and um, we'd like to talk about what the, the love of Star Wars can do for you. So, if you love Star Wars, and maybe you want to be a writer, a painter, a sculptor, uh, if you want to do electrical engineering, all of these things uh, are there's something in the Star Wars world for that. Computers, books, comics, you want to draw. I mean, there's everything. So that's that's what our main goal here is, to like just really use Star Wars as an inspiration and like a jump-off place to whatever career you can do. I love that. I, you know, people don't even think about it, but um, my brother-in-law's dad was an industrial engineer and mm. he designed packaging for toys. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. So there's... I, a guy who has to design how this package is going to work to actually hang it up in the store. So it's all sorts of different careers. So, you know, absolutely. I Anything love that. You that's, can think of. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> you just never know. Like maybe that's a book they need to write the many million different careers you can have. And because you always hear about the, you know, the directors inspired and the, you know, writers who were inspired by Star Wars and sometimes you forget all the other opportunities there are. That's right. And that's right. And, and again, I, I love writing databases. That's really when I can like take this, you know, the, the cataloging here and apply that to writing something that's really efficient. It really makes me happy and it's so geeky. <laughs> You sound like a kindred spirit. <laughs> I'm tr always trying to spreadsheet things. So. Yeah, spreadsheet. <laughs> it's awesome, kids. Really, give it a try. <laughs> yes, Teresa and I have this cool spreadsheet that's like the guests we had on and what character we discussed and all sorts of, yeah. you know, and it keeps getting longer and longer, so... <laughs> Oh, uh, it's very useful information to have, and, and I always feel like if you're armed with information, you are the most powerful person in the world. <laughs> well, the Star Wars fans are definitely armed with information. <laughs> True. Uh, yeah, a lot of, you know, I would say 90% of Star Wars fans actually know more about Star Wars than I do. Um, it kind of blows my mind, but it's true. That's, that's all right. Everybody has their own. I remember... One of the first times I was on, um, was it one of the Clone Wars um, roundtables on Rebel Force Radio? And they were talking about a bunch of the characters from Empire Strikes Back, like IG-88 and Bosk. And okay. I was sort of like, I don't, I don't know who they're talking about. And then <laughs> I was like, maybe I just don't know enough. And then I realized that I made a lot of really good points that they hadn't considered about Star Wars. And because yeah. I sort of went through that moment of panic where, like, I don't know enough information, but I realized I just knew different type of information. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that's why yeah. I enjoy the fandom because I've many times not known an answer and been like, well, I'm just going to ask my friends. It's perfect. Exactly. And that's, <laughs> that's why we have a community together. If we all knew <laughs> have, everything. We wouldn't need each other. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Just to wrap it up, what are you looking forward at with this exciting new opportunities? What, what's exciting you about Star Wars going forward? The fact that there is more Star Wars, it should be exciting enough for anybody, I had hope. Um, that's pretty amazing. When I came to work for Steve, it was in um, 2006, so right after Episode 3, and I was like, oh, that's it. 
uh, it's done, I'm too late to have any fun, and oh my God, it is just taken off, and Star Wars truly is forever, and Steve said that, and it is correct, and oh. it just keeps going and going and going, and around every corner, there's something new and fun. I really like J.J. Abrams' style, too, and so I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited for that. That's awesome. I I know if there, I I know when we got the news, it was sort of like I was really excited, but then the farther we move along, I'm starting to realize it really is. I remember sitting in the Phantom Menace, just sort of being like, I'm watching a Star Wars movie again. I'm watching a Star Wars movie again because I yeah. thought I'd never see one again. And and then my moment where it all came sort of hit me in the theater was when Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon and Darth Maul started fighting and I'm like oh man this this is Star Wars like it, it was sort of like it was I knew but my brain wasn't really absorbing it and then all of a sudden that happened I'm like wow what happened you know episode <laughs> one really has kind of a special place for me um, it's not my favorite movie but it had such emotion in myself attached to it and I saw it I don't know 15 20 times in the theater and um it was just so excited to have Star Wars back you know so you know you you attribute your own experience and you attach it to the movie like that but I think it's very great yes I future's wide open (laughs) exactly I hope I hope we still because you nowadays a lot of movies, people just buy tickets early and they go. But one of the my favorite moments was the Revenge of the Sith line at our mm. theater. They showed it in every every theater, and there were just just thousands of people lined up because I think it was like in ten of the theaters in, that they had at this one place. And then they, you know, they started funneling us in, so we were one in one of the earliest people seated so it was going to take longer for them to start but it was just crazy people were like yelling out trivia and just you know shouting lines from the movie the movie hadn't even started people not from the phantom menace but old movies and then other fans would yell back at them and it was crazy (laughs) that's really cool i mean that's i mean we love community we love love each other and uh the fandom is, is great I I love it. Well, Anne, it was so great talking to you and just hearing about your fabulous, you know, Rancho Obi-Wan and everything you do and work so hard. And it's great to see that I I didn't know about your, you know, where your career had been and how it led to that. So it's even more exciting for me. So well, I'm always so doing <laughs> I'm always tooting about, you know, STEM and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Getting You can do anything with that kind of career. So yeah. so are you going to Celebration Anaheim? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Good. Well, come by the Rancho Obi-Wan Experience booth um, and say hey. I will. Thank you very awesome. much. Teresa, that was so much fun and Anne is really kind, generous person, and I just love that her angle is she wants to bring Star Wars to all the fans. So I can't wait to see what they bring this celebration and how fun. But one of the things that she didn't get to speak about that came up since then, since we did the interview, was that now they have the Rancho Obi-Wan Recruiter Program, which is really exciting to kind of help people be part of Rancho Obi-Wan and sort of spread the word. So you can go to their site and learn about how to be part of that. And you can win some amazing prizes. A grand prize is a funded trip to Rancho Obi-Wan to attend the 2015 Galloween annual fundraising event, which is what she did talk about on the interview. And it's just really cool that that could be one of the things you could get to do next year. Rancho Obi-Wan is such a cool thing, and I can't wait to go at some point in my life. I think it'll be really cool. I'm actually still, I'm not a member. I still haven't done that. Have you? I have not, but that's on my list of things to do for this year. Me so too. That, wait, that is. 2015, New Year's resolution? Yes, <laughs> especially after talking to her and just seeing, and I know, because Teresa's way more into the collecting because I still ask her, like, well, are you, like, not allowed to open this package or, you know, do you have to hang this? No, I know. Teresa doesn't necessarily um, subscribe to the 
some of the collecting rules I know, right? Sometimes they're, you they're not rules. It's like um it's like the pirates code. It's more of like a <laughs> guideline, really, than anything. It's like the pieces of pieces of eight. Nine, eight that are the really nine, nine pieces, pieces of eight. Yeah. <laughs> um so it's really more of a guideline. I think it's more of how you as a collector what you want your collection to be. Um, do you want your collection to be everything in packaging and blah, blah, blah? Or do you want to have everything out and have to dust it all the time? I mean, it's, you know, there are pros and cons to both ways and no way is right or wrong. Except for I open everything. So that's the right way for me. I just imagine some person who's a collector now who thinks back on being like a child and taking whatever out of the package on Christmas morning and then like chewing on the head or something whoa, you whoa, know whoa. Oh. <laughs> that's, <laughs> a li- that's a bit intense <laughs> hey you just said you got to test the gold I, mean, I don't right? know if I ever chewed on any of my toys oh I chewed on like pencil ends and stuff yeah I don't think just... it's the same thing yeah every I, I well... chew on Han Solo's head <laughs> he he! If he had his, you know, his stormtrooper bucket on. I mean, I ate on. Play-Doh. I may have licked glue. I don't think this. Did you have the easy bake oven? Okay, I wasn't cool enough to have an easy bake oven. However, we did have the creepy crawler thing where you could make your own like little like floppy gummy. They're not gummy because you can't eat them, but creepy crawlers. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I had oh. that. Um, I had, I'm trying to think of like iconic toys that I had growing up. Um, a light bright, light bright was like, oh my gosh. If you had a light bright, you were amazing. Magna doodle. Oh yeah. Magna doodle was awesome. So Teddy all these Ruxpin. things now should have Star Wars on them. So How you know, cool would it just... be if Teddy Ruxpin had a TIE fighter pilot outfit? I do you well, even know what maybe... Teddy Ruxpin is. Yes, I do. <laughs> Do you even know what it is? I, I want a Cabbage Patch. Oh, or what? man, Cabbage Patch dolls. Cabbage Patch dolls were amazing. But Cabbage Patch dolls also confused me because I didn't understand why they came from a Cabbage Patch and how cabbages had babies. It, it was midichlorian. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's they where had... Anakin came from. Anakin's a Cabbage Patch doll. Oh, <gasps> Shabbat. <laughs> I have now discovered the true meaning of the force, the force birth of Anakin. He came from a cabbage patch. That's where she found him. So I, I hope someday that it becomes a point in canon. That fact. image in my head is so funny. <laughs> that is wrong. And maybe that's where we should leave this episode. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. We appreciate everyone who has um, listened to our show. And um, we are sorry if we've scarred you for life. And um, we hope you come back. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Really do. We appreciate everybody that's contacted us and shared their thoughts with us. We do read them. We've read every email. Um, I know Trisha responds to some people. Um, I usually read stuff on my phone. And I don't always have a chance to email you guys back. But we will get to all of the content just having a monthly show sometimes we don't have room to put everything in but we love you all we think you're awesome try to follow you guys back on social media so if you will go over there um and you're trying to help us reach our goal of having i think we said a thousand followers or something Mm -hmm. you can go over to twitter and follow us we're at fg going rogue trisha is at fangirl cantina and she doesn't need more followers so you can come follow me i'm at ice cold penguin (laughs) um you can also same usernames for instagram as well our email address is fangirlsgoingrogue at gmail.com. I get to do the fun part, the voicemail, which we are getting more and more of, so that's very exciting. Keep calling. Voicemail 331-21-EWALK. That's 331-213-9657. You can go and find us on Facebook. to search Fangirls Going Rogue. We pop up. Tumblr, fangirlsgoingrogetumblr.com. And please go like Rebel Force Radio on iTunes. Leave a positive review. And in your review, mention how much you like the Fangirls Going Rogue. Because we appreciate it when you do that. Yep. So until next time. Yep. Yep. Yep.